Hello, so uh, we're here for the second lecture from the series on uh, complex Adamar matrices. The first lecture was about the real case, so now I'll start the, the complex Adamar matrix uh, things. So it's going to be in two parts. Today we'll talk about uh, general definitions and uh, algebraic aspects. So it's going to be a bit, uh, a bit hard. I mean, uh, no matter where you go with some algebra, you, you reach the difficult problems. So I'll try to understand what this, uh, these problems are. And next lecture will be more about geometry and analysis. So let's have this uh, started in this presentation. So here we go, complex Adamar matrices, as I was telling you, so basics and a uh, lot, uh, lot of algebra, let's say, that's what we'll do today. So a complex Adamar matrix is exactly uh, as a real one. I mean, it's a square matrix, but this time over the unit circle, and uh, which is denoted T, because it's a torus after all, so that's the notation T whose rows are pairwise orthogonal with respect to the usual scar of product, uh, which is the one over here. So uh, linear at, uh, at left, anti-linear at right. Basic examples, of course, the, the usual Adamar matrices. These are those which happen to be real. There are also many other uh, interesting examples to be discussed uh, in what follows. So we'll have plenty of, uh, of matrices, don't worry. So let's start with some basic properties. Like uh, it's exactly what uh, we knew from the real case, but uh, we can uh, recycle that in this setting. So first of all, the orthogonality condition between rows means that it's a unitary matrix up to a uh, square root of Henry scaling. So the set formed by the this n times n Adamar matrices is this guy here. So m n of t. These are the matrices, and the rows must be orthogonal. So as you can see, it's a real algebraic manifolds appearing as an intersection of smooth manifolds, but uh, the intersection is very high from, uh, very far from being smooth. So uh, this will be something that uh, we will get into in the next lecture. Now we're just trying to um, work out basic uh, algebraic aspects. So it's basically real algebraic geometry, what we're doing. All right, so this is our, uh, our manifold. Now, what we knew from the real case, and I apply exactly the same in the complex case, is that uh, these matrices are stable and there are, you can uh, permute uh, rows and columns, also uh, multiply any row by a number in T, or multiply any column by a number in T. So these four operations work together are called uh, equivalence. So we'll use this equivalence relation every time when uh, classifying, let's say, complex Adamar matrices. Uh, why this is true? Because MN of T is of course stable by, by all this, and if per root row columns and the entry stays the same, right? And uh, it's the same for the unitary group, uh, pre-scaled or not. You can permute rows, columns, multiply them. It's still, uh, it's still unitary, so this is clear. And the second thing is that you can uh, conjugate, transpose, and take adjoints. So, uh, in fact, so all these operations, of course, they preserve a man of T, they preserve also the unitary group, rescaled or not, so uh, definitely we get Adamar matrices. And that's a bit different from the real case because in the real case, the matrices were coming in pairs somehow, H and H transpose, well, or just, um, I mean, in the non-symmetric case, but uh, they're generically coming in pairs, now they come in quadruplets. So we have H, H bar obtained by putting bars everywhere, H transpose by, by flipping, transposing, and H star diagonal matrix, which is obtained by uh, putting bars and flipping at the same time. So it's uh, just a little bit more complicated and also making tensor products. I mean, some proof as in the real case, just try down the formula and orthogonality and it's a one line proof. No, uh, yeah, so it's basically the same thing as in the real case, but we're no longer in combinatorics, we're in geometry now. And uh, yeah, I always remember to, to use T instead of plus minus one, for instance, when we're switching signs. And we have, uh, yeah, these operations here, and uh, they come in quadruplets somehow. Now, yeah, let's see the, the example. So uh, the basic example, which is uh, motivating actually, is the, the Fourier matrix. 
So it, uh, it just take uh, in roots of unity, the, the first one, well, can be a primitive one, but let's not bother with that. And I take powers of it, W to die J. Now, uh, it's useful actually in this kind of, for, for any kind of free analysis, discrete, to, to use indices from zero to n minus one. It's always better than uh, from one to n. So if you use these indices, it looks like this. You see it starts with ones for each row and column, which means that it's so-called in defaced form. I mean, there are no phases here and here. So that's, the, um, that's why we use indices from zero to n minus one. Uh, well, when this is true, so if you compute scalar products, uh, you have to think of it in a complex plane. So you have progression. So uh, the scalar products divided by n are just some very centers of regular polygons, so they'll vanish, right? There's no need to, you know, for any kind of algebra to sit in the plane, using the fact that the very center of a regular polygon center is zero is zero. So that's your, uh, that's your proof. Uh, now, why is this matrix called Fourier? So uh, it's the Fourier matrix of the cyclic group. So let's get into this a bit more now. So uh, more generally, so I'll take a finite abelian group. Okay, for, for Zn, we'll get this Fourier matrix that was there. But let's do it in general, finite abelian group. Then if you look at the characters, so uh, group morphism into T, this is the so-called group dual, you know, G hat. And now we have the Fourier coupling between G and G hat. It's just applying the character to the, to the number. I chi goes to chi of i. So uh, the point now is that G and uh, G hat are, uh, are isomorphic, right? I mean, for instance, if you use a decomposition like this into product of cyclic groups, G hat will have the same decomposition. So uh, if you use the isomorphism, what you have here is the matrix, right? So square matrix because I, the I index varies in G, the chi varies in G hat, but G, G hat have the same cardinality if you want. So we get a square matrix, of course it's in T because the characters have by definition values in T, and this is complex Adamar. So that's, uh, yeah, just very elementary group theory, you just compute there, the orthogonality it works, no problem. Now for a cyclic group, we obtain uh, the Fourier matrix Fn, why is that true? Because the cyclic group, uh, well, the characters are exactly powers of these rules of unity. I mean, I goes to W to the I, something like that. So you get exactly this matrix here, which might look a bit scary in matrix form, but as long as we don't write matrix form, things are just trivial. So, uh, okay, this is something trivial actually. And uh, now in general, uh, well, so you have this theorem, right? About finite abelian groups, they decompose as products. Then the corresponding Fourier matrix will decompose as products, tensor products. Well, Fourier matrices of this type, a phenomenon, cyclic. So once again, all this is, uh, all this is very standard. And uh, as examples, uh, well, of course, we have the Fourier matrix before, right? But uh, yeah, so any Fourier matrix of a finite abelian group is a tensor product of guys like this. Also, the Walsh matrices, remember, these are obtaining uh, from uh, W2 by tensoring with itself n times. But W2, the first Walsh, Walsh matrix, is F2. Yeah, let's take a look here. So if I plug in n is 2, that's my matrix. And the root of unity is minus one. So it's one, 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 minus one is the first Walsh matrix. Now, if you tensor with it n times, as to get the higher Walsh matrices, the group, according to this three item here, uh, will uh, make products with itself. So uh, that's, uh, the Walsh matrix is the Fourier matrix of the group Z2 to the N. Very nice. So uh, this is very different from the classical case because as you can see, Complex Adamar matrices exist at any end. No, no Adamar conjecture here. Uh, well, at least so far, we'll see later that we have some, uh, some analogs of that. Um, now, what else? Uh, we have tensor products, of course, that you can deform. You can plug in a parameter Q. You see, so these are the formulas exactly of the tensor product. And I can plug in a, a rectangular matrix either this way, QIB, 
or like this with QGA. So just verify this very simple computation and you get um, some deformations of the tensor products, parameter Q, so uh, this is a rectangular matrix formed by numbers or unit circle. So you get two of them, left deformation, right deformation, left deformation, uh, due to this uh, construction. Now this we can, we have enough things for classifying up to n is four. So uh, at n is two, three, you only have f two x three up to equivalence. This follows, uh, well, from basic geometry in the complex plane, and you have to play there when the, when the sum of three numbers is zero, things like that on a circle. It's really fun, I recommend it as an exercise. And the case n is four is fun too. I mean, once again, you have, uh, it's basically numbers on the circle, right? When you compute the scalar products, we want to see when uh, sums of things on the circle vanish and have like three angles parallelograms. It's very fun. And that n is four, uh, you get not only Fourier, but also it's Dita deformations because F4, you have Dita deformations of F2 tensor F2, right? And actually this uh, kind of collapse, they are equivalent. And uh, in the end, it's not to equivalence. You just, just get the one parameter family, the parameter being uh, on the circle. And uh, that's, yeah, you can write it in many forms. That's one of the, the standard forms. So it's, it's here in the parameter S. So once again, very nice geometry in the plane, I uh, recommend. Now let's get to N is five. So this is terribly difficult, N is five. So uh, the idea is that uh, F5, the Fourier matrix is the only one. And this was open for a long time and sold by, by Uffe Hager for the very tough computation. So here is his main lemma somehow, which is extremely surprising. So you take another matrix, uh, arbitrary H, and you see by using the equivalence relation, I can always deface, I mean, assume that it's one, one, the first row and column, just multiply here and here, but what you need for getting ones. So I can only assume that matrix is like this. And let's just look at this little guy here, this two by two matrix, A, X, Y, B. Well, Hagero discovered that this uh, must satisfy this extremely strong equation. So you see either X is Y or X is AB or Y is AB. Very strange. So how is the proof? Well, very tricky. <laughs> So uh, no one really knows how hard you found that, but uh, the idea is that if you write the orthogonality condition between the first three rows, have three equations and you play with them and uh, you know, get to something like this. I mean, you see the stars here, the four stars here, you manage to, to get rid of them somehow in the computations. So you end up something uh, with something evolving on the A, B, X, Y, like this, which is already very strong. And now we're playing a bit more uh, with this, you get to this. Now, once you have this, uh, well, you're almost done because we are, this thing will happen all across the matrix, right? I can move by my two by two matrix by permitting rows and columns everywhere. So we'll have very, very strong conditions everywhere across the matrix and uh, well, with a bit more effort, to, uh, which actually takes a few pages. You eventually led to fifth roots of unity are solutions to your equations, and that's your matrix that you get, the Fourier F5. So, very nice, uh, very tough result by Hagia Roop. When was that? Mid 90s, I think, which closes the, the discussion. Now, any six, it's even more terrible, and it's uh, completely open as of now, 2020. So, not much hope of. Uh, of solving it. So uh, as just a sample of what can be done here, this is a result of Boshon Iquara dealing with a self-adjoint case. Okay, so self-adjoint. And here's the thing. So by doing some kind of algorithm report, it's totally terrible in their paper too, he reached to the conclusion that uh, the self-adjoints are up to equivalence so one parameter family, which are like this. And uh, the parameter is actually one of the variables there. We have four variables and their adjoints and good signs. So this is one of the parameter and the other three appear like this. And this is not, there's no way of simplifying. I mean, that's, and that's the final result. And uh, yeah, it's real algebraic geometry of the worst kind, if you want, things like that. So now in general at any six, yeah, there are many other things of this, this type, so we won't get into many details here. 
just check the, the literature surveys and all that well, for my solos and the others. And uh, but yeah, that's somehow the type of thing that you get into. It's uh, well, yeah, let's get away from that. Okay, probably a good idea. So let's look now at the root of unity case. You see here I have no roots of unity, that's why it's uh, look so bad. So uh, we call a atomar matrix of but some type with then these are roots of unity. Uh, roots of unity are always denoted by zero, okay, in a CP group. Roots of unity, can talk about the level, that's the smallest integer such that uh, uh, the order of the roots. And the buts and class, there are many notations here. Here I'll be using uh, this one, HN of L. So N is the size and L is the, the order of the roots. What are the main examples? Of course, the real Adamar matrices. So with these notations, that's exactly HN of two. Okay, two means order two, so plus minus one. Also Fourier matrices, remember these were powers of the n's roots, so belong to HN of n. And also those more general, if you tensor such guys, uh, well, you get something about some two, of course. Now, but some is very interesting because HN of two, I remind you, these are the Adamar matrices. And so you have the Adamar conjecture, AC, also the Sir plant one. So what are the, the analogs of HC and CHC in this setting? And the problem is that there are many obstructions actually. So we have uh, the Batson obstruction coming from just the orthogonality of two rows. To take a prime power, n must be a multiple of x. Uh, now, in the real case, for instance, this means that the size of the matrix must be a multiple of two. So this is weak actually. The Sylvester obstruction that we learned last time, uh, coming from three rows, tells us that it must be a multiple of four up to this exceptional thing here in the beginning, two volume. So we have this type of uh, obstructions. Uh, then you have many other, like uh, Deloney, for instance, uh, looked into this, so uh, each matrix has a determinant, right? And the determinant, of course, must be a rest of unity and satisfy this. And this is not automatic. I mean, it can happen or not, the existence of such a thing. So you get some uh, obstructions on on LNL coming from the determinants, which are quite tricky. I mean, this is not, uh, not trivial arithmetics. Also, as something scary, we have this Hager obstruction. So you see, Hager proved that the Fourier matrix is the only one at five. So in particular, it's the only buts. And so uh, you see H and of L is different from zero in place uh, five divides L because you must have Roots of unity of order five. So you see all this is looks like totally random, all these obstructions, how to unify them. And uh, one of the important ones somehow is the Batson one. Let me let me show you. So this can be enlarged. There is some theory going uh, behind it. And this is a theorem, but which is deep due to Lam and Long, uh, called uh, in their paper, uh, how it called vanishing sums of roots of unity. So uh, the idea is that the vanishing sum of roots of unity, which is what we need for a Batson matrix, must have the same length as uh, something trivial, like a sum, sum of full sums of roots of unity. So that's your obstruction. Now, uh, well, this somehow makes, does it make, so this fits here, generalizes the Batson obstruction. And, uh, but the thing still looks quite complicated. So one idea would be somehow to, take the case when n is big. You see, I mean, these kind of things disappear when n is big because this set here is a, it's a bit exceptional in the beginning and then it's all the integers. So this disappears, you see, when it's big. So I think that's, uh, that's a whole good idea to look into uh, all these problematics of the HC and also the circular one to look when it is big but what can be said because Many of these obstructions, yeah, just disappear. So that's an interesting uh, question. Now, uh, once again, in relation to roots of unity, but now getting back to classification, let's try to do something at six, at any six, and also seven, you see. So let's call cycle any full sum of roots of unity, which might be rotated. So it's a trivial vanishing thing. And more generally, we can take several things like that and take the formal sum. So these are trivially vanishing things. 
You see, as an example, for instance, if you take the six roots of unity, this is clearly zero. I mean, one uh, W two W four I sum up to zero, the equilateral triangle, and then I have W and minus W, and can, I can always multiply by a Q. So I told you this can be rotated. So the idea I have is that the sum of cycle is something like this, completely trivially vanishing. Now I have also counterexamples. So you see, if you take that's the simplest one. If you take roots of unity of order 30, this weird sum here, uh, well, you can picture it somehow. I, I forgot to put a picture of this. It sums up to zero and it's, it doesn't decompose like that because it's a sum of cycles but with negative coefficients. So if you add some more things here, some other powers of W which are needed, a few of them, you can split them in, uh, into trivial things. But somehow, you see, that thing's removed. It, it's something non-trivial somehow. So this is, of course, related to lam Leung. So you see, the, the size must be something like this. And this is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It has size 6. So uh, yeah, of course, you get two equilateral triangles. I mean, it has the same size as a sum of cycles by lam Leung. It's a bit subtle here. But anyway, it's very interesting. This was a counterexample where I interested in the example. So trivial things, okay, maybe rotated. So now let's call another mathematics regular. If uh, the scalar products appear like this trivially somehow. And uh, actually there's a problem here. So many people use regular for what we call be stochastics. So uh, some uh, equal on rows and columns. We'll talk later about be stochastics. Here I'm using the analysis terminology, so bistochastic is reserved for uh, bistochastic, so I'll use here something else for regular, which is free. So, uh, what are the regular matrices? Well, at any six, yeah, we can have a classification result. That's work I did a long ago with uh, Bishon and Schlenker. So, have, of course, it's a deformation of F6, plus these two matrices of Hagerup and, uh, and of Tau. One is with a parameter order four roots and the tall one with the uh, order three roots. So this is very interesting. I mean, there was all this mess at any six and at least we have a result full classification. So there are three cases for the proof actually, depending on how the sum split and you get these three cases. It's of F6, Aguirre for tall. So this is very nice. Now uh, at any seven, you have this interesting construction of solo Z. So it's a design construct reconstruction. So you take a defaced real Adamar matrix symmetric, and then you can, uh, well, you can do all these things here, erase all points, whatever, and you get uh, an Adamar matrix which has highs and minus one. So this is it. Let me give you an example right away. So if you take the wall shade, remember we need uh, yeah, and greater than eight for the sigma to collapse somehow. The phase symmetric, so wall shade satisfies this. So we get a seven by seven matrix, and that's the one, it's a so-called Petrescu matrix at Q is one. So Petrescu discovered that you can also put some Qs here and here. So, okay, so at seven now, back to classification. We have, of course, Fourier. But you have as well this uh, Petrescu matrix, depending on parameter, which originally was found as a, quite a very exceptional thing and a counterexample to an old conjecture. But there's a whole story here it's on a computer, but actually something conceptual coming from the solar construction. And the conjecture is that the only regular matrices are F7, P7, Q. So uh, that's uh, yeah, a lot of work here. And, uh, Tried a bit with uh, the student of mine, Pito, but we weren't able to do it finally. Also, Schlenker, Kiran Dani, has some work on F7. So, uh, yeah, very interesting thing, which is not, uh, not done yet. So, uh, yeah, let's end now with circular matrices. So, we haven't talked about them yet. So, as I told you, there's no analog of the CHC, the circular MR conjecture in this setting, because the free matrix can be put in circular form. Uh, well, of course, you get to the bottom class. There are a lot of things there, like work by theory, many others. But uh, let's uh, just explain here the basic things. So, uh, what's the idea? Uh, well, it's quite tricky. You have to use this uh, for every every time that you do something with circulants. You have to use this this trick of Bjork. So, uh, I think that H is circular and gamma is the first row vector. 
And then you just divide gamma i by gamma i minus one, we call this yi. And this yi satisfies relations which are simpler than those giving that gamma i. So these are the relations look very good. It's a so-called cyclic root. Okay, so it's the same thing. Adam matrix is your and psychic roots. And with this, you can prove, for instance, very easily that uh, the Fourier matrix Fn can be put in circular form. So, as an example, here is a five put in circular form. And uh, what I found here, the proof is very simple because this is obviously Adam R, which has compute by Hagen, it can only be Fourier, right? But, uh, well, that's more than as a joke. Now, uh, in general, yeah, you can spend some time doing this. I mean, it's not easy, so you really have to use these Bjork roots. And uh, here is your uh, cyclic root. So you do some uh, notations here, and that's your root, and it works. But, uh, but it's tricky. I mean, it takes half a page, and without Bjork, you cannot get it. Of course, there is a lot of uh, further work in this direction, especially by Bakken, you know, all preprint. You can deform these things. It's very interesting stuff. Now, finally, let's end with another result of Hagerup. So that's uh, Hagerup wrote two, two big papers there, and this five one, and this uh, this other one with the counting of uh, of circular matrices when n is prime. So he got a precise exact formula. That's the number. It's finite, and it's uh, two n minus two choose n minus one, and the proof is completely non-trivial. So first, you have to take the Bjork uh, cyclic roots and uh, Further apply some Fourier things there, it's a bit complicated it's when n is prime. And then you get a system to be solved, and there, uh, well, you get into some minors, whatever determinants, and uh, you have to use this term of Chebotarev, which says that when n is prime, all the minors of the phenomenon are zero. So this gives you already finiteness, which is non trivial at all. Once you have finiteness, you can fine tune a bit the proof and actually do the precise count. And these guys appear with some multiplicities, actually, and algebraic geometric multiplicities. So a very nice result by, uh, by Hagerup. So that's the situation with the complex Adamar matrices. As you see, uh, yeah, difficulties everywhere, and uh, roots of unity on that. It's, it's a kind of weird arithmetic. So next time we'll get into analysis, it's going to be maybe a little less, uh, less wild. <laughs> Okay, guys, uh, so I uh, well, hope you like it and uh, see you soon for uh, analysis lecture.